Okay, we've looked briefly at how data can be managed and put into order, the different types of data that are encountered in the world, and how we might differentiate between these classes of data. Next, we're gonna talk about how we might begin to summarize and or analyze the data we have. Each type of data requires a set of approaches to summarizing and analysis. For example, we can take an average of ages in a class or school, but there's not a meaningful measure of average hair color. It is much more appropriate to consider the most and least frequent hair colors as these are nominal data and have to be summarized as such. Also, with regards to analysis of qualitative data, we employ specific software and statistical approaches that allow us to draw meaningful conclusions from the data. Focus group transcripts are a great example of this, in which very specialized software can draw out themes from conversations had between a couple or several people. Now let's talk about how to make sense of the seemingly endless amount of information available to us. We need techniques for summarizing the data once we've captured it and organized it properly. Hopefully by the end of this section, you will have a good idea about how to effectively do this for each type of data you may encounter. Looking at an example set of data from the County Health Rankings website, we can see the conventions we discussed in the previous sections. That is, our records are along the left-hand column, which in this case are counties and their respective states. We have variables along the top row and specific data points within the cells created by cross-referencing the county with a particular variable. In this case, we have three variables, premature death, poor or fair health, and poor physical health days. The data for each variable are expressed as a raw number, a rate calculated using county population information, 95% confidence intervals and z-scores. The confidence intervals and z-scores will be discussed in depth in a later section. The organization of these data make it very easy to reference and compare premature death rates between counties, for example, along with many other summary evaluations. When we approach a particular data set, it's important we begin with a question in mind. It's sometimes useful to simply absorb the data, but for any real work to begin, we must first have a question in mind. Some examples of questions associated with this data set may be, which counties have the lowest or highest years of potential life loss or YPL rate across the counties? What is the average number of YPL? Or what does the distribution of YPL across the counties look like? These are some basic questions that can help us begin to understand this important health statistic as it relates to the counties in our service region. The first question is fairly straightforward but provides some important information about the counties in our data set. We just need to sort the data so we can visually see which counties have the highest and lowest YPL. The second question requires the calculation of an average YPL using the formula presented here in which we sum up the YPL values for each county and divide by the number of counties. The third question of how the distribution of YPL looks across the counties is accomplished by displaying the data graphically to see where the YPL rates cluster and how frequent are the higher and lower rates. Now for some vocabulary. First, we start with the mean, which is the average of a set of numerical values that represents the central tendency of that set. The mean is where the data fan out from, making it central to the values found in the data. We only calculate the mean value when summarizing numerical data. Median is a ranked measure of central tendency. To calculate the median, we must order the data from lowest to highest and select the middle number. This measure has importance when the data are skewed or loaded toward a higher or lower value. The median can offer a more accurate description of those data. The mode refers to the most frequent set of numbers found in the data set. When looking at a bar graph, this would be the tallest bar. To calculate the mode, we must order the data and then count the frequencies of individual responses. This measure is well suited for summarizing categorical or qualitative data. The range is simply the distance between the lowest and highest values in the data set. We use this measure to begin to get an idea about the spread of the data. Let's look at an example of how to summarize different types of data. In the table presented here, we have nine records with information for each from four variables. Number of attempts, one and two, class rank, and favorite color. It doesn't necessarily matter what the variables are measuring for our purposes, but they appear to be describing characteristics of students. Starting with attempts one, 
we should have noticed right off the bat that this variable appears to be numeric. So we can start our explanation with a calculation of mean, which we do using the formula previously discussed and presented again here. Our results indicate that the average number for attempts one was 27, a number we arrived at by rounding up from 26.55. The mean is the average, which is calculated by adding up all the values dividing by the number of occurrences. Before we charge ahead with our mean values calculated here, let's take a closer look at our data set. One thing of note is that each record in the data set has a first and second attempt number associated with it, meaning each record is measured at least twice. Another point is that there appears to be a very large number in the number of attempts to column. This value is what we consider an outlier, which may be causing the column of data to be skewed. These are histograms with the height of the bars indicating frequency of response. If the data have a normal distribution, that means most responses are around the middle. For example, if the variable measured is number of cigarettes smoked daily and the histogram is normally distributed, then most folks smoke a middle of the road number of cigarettes. In this case, only a low number of people smoke very few cigarettes in a day and only a few smoke a lot of cigarettes in a day. This distribution makes sense as people who share characteristics like smoking tend to create an average just by their nature and cluster around it. Another example is minutes to complete an exam. Only a few people are going to finish very quickly, and only, only a few will take a very long time. If you've been in a classroom taking a test, you know that at some point, a bunch of folks finish at around the same time. The skewed data suggests that our sample has something about it that causes responses to cluster around the very high or very low end. The example here is the very high end. Back to the smoking example, perhaps we drew a sample from a group of folks who tend to smoke a lot. Not sure what that group would be, but perhaps you can think of some. If we order the data, we can see that 145 is 122 units higher than the next closest number. This suggests the need for a median calculation, which as we stated previously, is a better measure of central tendency for skewed data. Now we also may want to remove this record from the calculation as it is clearly an outlier. In fact, this is probably the best approach. For our purposes, we just want to digest the concept that median is a better measure of central tendency when the data are skewed, meaning the data cluster toward one end of the possible range of values rather than the middle. So let's do that. The first thing to do when calculating the median is to order the data, which has already been done because we have such powerful foresight. When we are dealing with an off number of observations, we just need to select the middle number, which in this case is 13, when we have even number observations, we take an average of the middle two numbers. The conclusion here is that the median number of attempts it took for students to be successful on the second try was 13, which indicates an improvement from attempt one. Okay, so we've done a good summary of the first two variables by applying the mean and median measures of central tendency. Now we should take a look at the other information provided in the data set. The question we may come up with first for the favorite color variable is what is the most popular color, which is essentially a question of mode or the most frequently reported favorite color. The figure generated here lets us answer that question very easily. By what we are seeing in the figure, we can conclude the mode or most frequently reported favorite color is red. Green and orange were the least popular colors. Moving on to class rank, we have a question first of how to best summarize the data. We have a few options and maybe we don't necessarily have to limit ourselves to just one. We could consider the mean or average rank within the class, or we could look at the most common class rank and then finally the range of class ranks seen in the data. The first thing we might do is calculate the mean using our trusty formula. We arrive at a mean value of three, which happens to also be the median. If we display the data in a bar graph again, we can see that the mode or most common class rank is three. The range is easy to determine, to determine since the data set is small and has already been sorted. Since the lowest class rank is two and the highest is four, our range is going to be two. Simple. So let's talk about histograms and bar graphs. Firstly, it's important to state that histograms and bar charts are not the same. They have one distinct visual difference that is associated with the types of data each is used to display. 
A histogram, which is presented here, is used to display continuous numerical data in a way that allows us to better understand the distribution of the data. Histograms are built by identifying bins that individual values fall within and develop frequencies for those bins. In the example here, the bins are 1 to 10, 11 to 20, 21 to 30, 31 to 40, and 41 to 50. Bar charts, on the other hand, are used to display categorical data, either ordinal or nominal. One distinct difference that should be obvious is the presence of gaps in between the bars. These gaps represent the qualitative difference between each value of the chart. The example given here is, of course, the nominal favorite color data. So we can see that the gaps indicate the lack of meaningful values between blue and purple, etc. So this week, we've covered how data are organized for easy reference, the types of data we will encounter in our work, how to quickly summarize data to better understand their characteristics, the difference between normal and skewed data. We've got two types of figures we use to display data. So now let's go do some work and practice what we've learned.